truly is uh, a pleasure for me to be here today to present to you the topic of hypercoagulability testing. Now, I know what many of you are thinking. It's Friday morning at 8 a.m., and there's nothing that sounds more boring than learning about hypercoagulability testing. But I promise you that this is an area of uh, fierce debate within the hematology community right now, and I will do my best to make it as interesting as possible. Um, when I was doing a literature review for this, I found no less than at least three um, uh, of these um, dueling opinion pieces in the literature in the last 10 years. Now, when I say dueling opinions, I mean these articles where they get one expert in the field to uh, write their opinion piece about why we should be doing something, and then another expert in the field to write their opinion piece about why we should not be doing something. And then they publish them together at the same time in the same journal. Um, and it's interesting to me because people love to debate the topic of hypercoagulability testing. Um, but as you'll see in the forthcoming talk, the evidence behind what we do is really lacking in this field. At the end of the lecture, I hope that we'll be able to describe the current trends in thrombophilia testing, list the most commonly ordered tests, explain the rationale for testing for a patient with a venous thromboembolism, which I'll refer to as VTE. We can discuss the benefits of testing as well as recognize the limitations and hopefully be able to identify appropriate candidates for thrombophilia testing. These are the ACGME general competencies, and I've put arrows next to the ones that I will be hopefully addressing in today's lecture. I'll start with a brief history of thrombophilia testing to really pique your interest, and then go into what the tests are, um, the potential benefits and potential limitations of testing. I'll briefly review the current guidelines that are available, and then uh, discuss the topic of uh, venous thrombosis in pediatrics and how that might differ from adults. And at the very end of the lecture, I will leave you with my approach to testing in pediatric patients with venous thromboembolism. So no talk in hematology would be complete without this. Many of you know that I love the coagulation cascade. And um, I love it because I think it makes sense. It's sort of like the periodic table, right? It seems very complex, hard to memorize, um, but once you really study it and figure out why things are where they are, it really starts to make sense. It finally clicks. Now, I'm not going to belabor this, but I just want to point out that um, if this pointer works, sort of, in black here, you'll notice the classic coagulation cascade factors. So factor 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Those are the factors that promote blood clotting. As the cascade falls downward, um, one factor activates another, and the end result is the conversion of prothrombin to thrombin, which then turns fibrinogen into the insoluble form of fibrin and results in a fibrin clot. I'll also point out on this slide that the items you see in red, such as antithrombin-3, protein C, um, these are the anticoagulant factors. So these work to keep the coagulation cascade in check um, they inhibit the cascade from flowing downward and thereby keep the body in a relative state of hemostasis so that at any given point we're not bleeding and we're not clotting. So it's a very complex system, but it's basically a system of positive and negative feedback to keep us in balance. And this idea of balance um, is illustrated here with the seesaw diagram. Um, on one side we have procoagulant um, effects and on the other anticoagulant effects. Now, when we talk about procoagulant effects, we know that there are many things in the world that can cause us to become more likely to have thrombus. Um, things like uh, the state of our bodies, if we have underlying inflammation, um, if there's pregnancy, um, if there's other external factors that are leading us uh, to be more prothrombotic. Um, in addition, when we talk about hypercoagulability testing, we're obviously talking about inherited risk factors that can make us more likely to be procoagulant. And on the opposite side, we have um, the anticoagulants. So if this seesaw becomes out of balance, if we have more anticoagulant effects than procoagulant effects, it's going to tip us one way and we're going to be more likely to have bleeding. Situations maybe uh, we're giving someone a blood thinning medication like heparin or warfarin, um, or perhaps someone has a congenital factor deficiency such as is seen in hemophilia. Um, these are the uh, clinical scenarios under which we tend to see bleeding because things are out of balance. <clears throat> 
And I'm going to be mostly talking today about this scenario, where the procoagulant effects outweigh the anticoagulant effects. So if we have inherited risk factors for thrombophilia, for example, we have elevated levels of coagulation factors or decreased levels of anticoagulation factors or other risk factors involved like central lines and obesity and smoking and things, these are going to tip us the opposite direction and lead to the formation of thrombosis. So the idea of venous thrombosis um, goes back to Rudolf Virchow, who was a German scientist in the 1800s. And everyone has heard of the, um, uh, heard the term Virchow's triad, which was attributed to him in about 1856. Um, now, Virchow was um, uh, an interesting guy. He was a very prominent scientist at the time. He contributed much in the way of um, our knowledge about cell biology, as well as the origins of cancer. And in particular, he was responsible for publishing his thoughts about pulmonary embolism and how pulmonary embolism, in fact, was likely to arise from thrombosis that was um, in more peripheral locations, such as the arms or the legs, that would then travel to the lungs. And he was really the first person to identify this as the cause of pulmonary embolism. In his research, he described some of these factors, such as stasis of blood flow, um, intrinsic hypercoagulability, and endothelial injury, but he did not actually elucidate them in these uh, simplified terms. And he really had nothing to do with the idea of the triad. Um, it wasn't until about 100 years later in the 1950s that someone decided they were going to coin this term, Burkhaus triad, and attribute it to him from 1856, which was when he published his paper on pulmonary embolism. Interestingly, Virchow wasn't right about everything. He was um, a staunch anti-evolutionist, as well as someone who didn't believe at all in germ theory. We're not all perfect. <laughs> so when we talk about uh, being more likely to have a blood clot, we know that there are many, many, many clinical risk factors that can lead us to be more likely to have thrombosis. Age is certainly a major one. As we get older, our vessels um, become uh, damaged and worn out. Um, if we have uh, a major surgery, if we're immobilized um, for several days in a row, we know that this leads to venous stasis and leads to inflammation and can cause us to have thrombosis. Pregnancy is definitely a relative state of thrombosis as well as the postpartum period. Um, many other inflammatory states like IBD, trauma and burns, sepsis, um, these all lead us to be more likely to have thrombosis. Um, the nephrotic syndrome, we lose uh, valuable anticoagulant proteins in the urine in this case and become prothrombotic. Uh, connective tissue disease such as lupus, um, estrogens you know, commonly in the form of estrogen containing oral contraceptive pills. Indwelling catheters, for sure, um, they damage our vascular endothelium, they disrupt blood flow, um, they often cause thrombosis. And then lifestyle risk factors such as obesity and smoking also contribute. So knowing that we have all these clinical risk factors, um, the idea of hypercoagulability testing, uh, to give you a brief history, really um, didn't come about until the uh, late 20th century. The various uh, pro and anticoagulant um, proteins were known in the literature, but it wasn't until 1964 um, when a Norwegian a doctor, Dr. Olav Egberg, um, was treating a family who had had recurrent venous thrombosis. He actually had to admit a mother in her 40s and her child in their teens at the same time to the hospital for venous thrombosis. And it was noted that the mother had also had a previous venous thrombosis, as well as several other family members. And he was able to look at the blood samples from these patients and determine that there was a, a missing, a, a, a low level of a known um, uh, anticoagulant, which at the time was coined antithrombin or antithrombin-3. So he was really the first person to put together this idea that there could be an inherited a risk for venous thromboembolism. Now, antithrombin-3, um, I put the graphic up here to remind you that it's a potent anticoagulant that acts at almost every level of the coagulation cascade. Um, so you can see how a mutation in this protein, which makes it um, decreased in quantity or makes it uh, dysfunctional, could easily lead you to be more prone to thrombosis. It's a rare trait, not found frequently in the population. Um, it's autosomal dominant, so one mutation can cause problems. And 
Um, in addition to being an inherited uh, hypercoagulable state, it's also seen in nephrotic syndrome because patients lose AT3 in the urine, and it's seen in liver disease because the liver is where AT3 is primarily made. The next step in the evolution of hypercoagulability testing uh, came in the United States in the early 80s. Again, protein C and protein S were not identified at this time, but it was the first time that it was identified to be um, an inherited disease-causing um, state. And again, it was identified because people were looking at families who had a significant history of venous thrombosis in multiple family members, and they were able to isolate these protein deficiencies at the time. So protein C and S are much like antithrombin-3. Um, they are serine proteases which um, act to inhibit the conversion of factor V to activated factor V and factor VIII to activated factor VIII. Um, I put the graphic up here to remind you that protein C is what we think of as primarily responsible for um, uh, preventing the uh, proteolytic conversion of factor V and factor VIII to their active forms, and protein S is seen as a cofactor for protein C to exert its effects. Activated protein C, you will hear me refer to as APC uh, going forward. So these conditions like antithrombin-3 deficiency are rare and are autosomal dominant. There are many mutations which have been described. Um, again, these can be seen in liver disease because they're not being produced. And because protein C and protein S are both vitamin K dependent factors, they're also seen in vitamin K deficiency. Now, I would take a step to the side just to talk for a moment about this entity of purpurifulminans. So although quite rare, there is a homozygous form of protein C deficiency and protein S deficiency um, known as purpurifulminans. And the reason I bring this up is because it's really important for a general pediatrician to be able to recognize this immediately. If you have a newborn baby who presents with um, extreme bruising, skin necrosis, perhaps DIC, um, if you don't pick up on this right away that this could be an inherited complete deficiency of protein C or protein S and treat the baby appropriately by replacing these factors, most commonly with fresh frozen plasma, um, these babies will almost all die um, soon if not properly recognized. Moving down the evolution of testing, uh, in 1983 in England, there was a doctor who really for the first time wrote an in-depth manuscript about the prevalence of uh, this thing called antiphospholipid antibodies. And scientists all over the world had been studying these for a while, but he was the first one to really um, sort of uh, put a comprehensive overview of them in the literature. Um, he was studying patients with lupus at the time, and he noted that many of them did have venous and arterial thrombosis, and he was able to isolate these antibodies. Uh, we commonly refer to them as anti-cardiolipin antibody, anti-beta-2 glycoprotein antibody, and the lupus anticoagulant. And these are antibodies which react to the phospholipids on the surface of plasma membranes. Um, and when they do that, they cause all sorts of problems, including arterial thrombosis, which I'm not really going to talk about in this talk very much, venous thrombosis, as well as pregnancy loss, miscarriage. Now, I put down here the mechanism is complicated and poorly understood, but I will briefly tell you that um, there are several different mechanisms by which antiphospholipids cause thrombosis. They interact with the vascular endothelial lining, um, and they interact with the surface of platelets, and they can also interrupt the normal um, complement activation pathway. And by these distinct mechanisms, they can um, damage the endothelial lining, they can activate and aggregate platelets, and they can disrupt the complement system, all leading to vascular thrombosis. The picture here is just um, uh, to remind us what happens in arterial thrombosis when you cut off blood supply to the distal extremities. Um, again, I'm mostly talking about venous thromboembolism here today. Uh, in the United States, in 1988, um, there was a publication that linked uh, the MTHFR mutation to the risk for um, myocardial infarction and atherosclerosis and stroke. The MTHFR mutation, or um, methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase mutation, refers specifically to a point mutation called C677T. It is a mutation that results in a thermolabile variant of MTHFR, which simply means that under normal conditions in the body, um, there is less MTHR, MTHFR available um, than normal. 
And MTHFR is important in the uh, pathway of um, homocysteine metabolism. It, there is a, a vitamin uh, B6 and B12 uh, dependent pathway by which homocysteine is recycled. And if you have decreased amounts of MTHFR, you can accumulate homocysteine in the blood. Um, there are heterozygous states for the C677T mutation as well as homozygous states. And um, over time, people noticed that patients, especially with the homozygous state, tended to have elevated levels of homocysteinemia. And uh, they were able to demonstrate in vitro that elevated homocysteine levels can directly damage the vascular endothelium and lead to thrombosis. Now, in the last five years, maybe even 10 years, we've really come to understand that the problem here is the elevated homocysteine level and not the mutation itself. There are many patients who carry at least one C677T MTHFR mutation, and if their homocysteine levels are normal, we do not consider that a risk factor for venous thromboembolism. So I would like to point out that we no longer recommend testing for MTHFR mutations for the purpose of predicting someone's risk of venous thromboembolism. Whether the adults are still using it to um, do risk assessments for the risk of myocardial infarction and atherosclerosis, um, I'm not sure. But in pediatrics, we no longer recommend testing for MTHFR. We simply test the homocysteine, and if the homocysteine is normal, we don't worry about it. This uh, hypercoagulable um, test, the Factor V Leiden mutation, is one of the most interesting and one of the most well-known. There was a group in the Netherlands in a town called Leiden who, in 1994, described um, a point mutation in the Factor V gene, which, in a sense, um, made it resistant to the actions of activated protein C, or APC. Um, and if you have a Factor V that's resistant to the anticoagulant effects of protein C, the cascade will continue to flow forward unchecked and make you prone to thrombosis. Um, in this town in the Netherlands, um, it was quite common, and we've learned from population studies over the years that about 5% of Caucasians carry um, one mutation for factor V Leiden, making it the most common inherited hypercoagulability. Um, it's much less in African Americans and Hispanics, maybe only as high as 1%, and it is quite rare in the Asian population. It's an autosomal dominant um, mutation so that inheriting one copy um, can cause problems. Because of its prevalence in the general population, it's actually not that uncommon to see people who are homozygous, who have two bad copies, and we'll see in a little bit that their risk for thrombophilia is elevated. Testing is usually genetic, although I wanted to just speak for a moment about APC resistance testing. Um, so APC resistance testing is a functional test, which is testing how sensitive your factor V is to activated protein C. If you have an abnormal APC resistance ratio, the chances are overwhelming that it is because of this point mutation known as factor V Leiden. About 92% of abnormal APC resistances are due to factor V Leiden. Um, but there are other causes as well. Um, other mutations in the factor V gene can cause it, as well as um, pregnancy, um, connective tissue disease, et cetera. Um, but APC resistance is sort of a, a first-line screening test if you don't want to send off the genetic testing for factor V Leiden. And lastly, uh, the same group in the Netherlands, a couple of years later, was able to identify yet another point mutation, this time in the prothrombin gene. Um, and they were able to show that this mutation actually caused elevated levels of prothrombin. So if you look here at the diagram, uh, towards the bottom of the cascade, we know that prothrombin gets proteolytically uh, cleaved to form thrombin. And thrombin is important for the conversion of uh, soluble fibrinogen into insoluble fibrin, as well as um, being a positive uh, feedback for much of the other reactions of the coagulation cascade. So thrombin is one of the really important things in the coagulation cascade. So if you have an upregulation of prothrombin, you have elevated levels of prothrombin, it just pushes the cascade forward. Uh, this mutation is not quite as common as factor V Leiden. It's about 1% to 3% in Caucasian populations and less frequent in African Americans and, again, quite rare in Asian populations. Um, because of its decreased prevalence in the population compared to factor V Leiden, it's actually quite rare to see patients who are homozygous for prothrombin mutation. And the testing in this case is genetic. One could argue that you could ju just test levels of prothrombin, but getting an elevated level of prothrombin one time wouldn't tell you if the patient is 
uh, chronically at risk for thrombosis because of persistently elevated levels or whether that was just a one-time test. So we do usually do genetic testing. All right, so factor eight. Factor eight is not part of the classic thrombophilia testing panel, but I pointed out here because we have increasing evidence to show us that uh, levels of factor eight, which are persistently above the upper cutoff of normal, 150%, are an independent factor for venous thromboembolism. Um, we often check factor eights um, along with CRPs and fibrinogens in patients who were concerned about underlying levels of inflammation. And um, there is something to be said for the role of inflammation itself in predisposing to venous thrombosis. But I did just want to point out that there are familial forms of elevated factor eight. Um, we do not know the causative mutation as of yet, um, but it is considered a risk factor for venous thromboembolism. And so you will see us check factor eight levels sometimes. Lipoprotein A, um, another sort of uh, non-traditional uh, hypercoagulability test. It's a cholesterol-like particle. Um, we know that elevations can cause risks for atherosclerosis and, and heart attack. And um, in pediatrics especially, there's uh, some evidence that it may be an independent risk factor for venous thromboembolism. Um, the theory about how this might work is that it shares homology with plasminogen and acts through competitive inhibition of fibrinolysis or breakdown of the clot. Um, and we can see levels uh, affected by uh, diet the same way we see cholesterol levels affected by diet. And we can also see elevated levels of lipoprotein A and renal disease. And this can be uh, treated with medication to bring down the levels if needed. So that concludes the uh, interesting story of how these hypercoagulability factors came to be. So what is our rationale for testing for these? Well. Venous thromboembolism, one could argue, is a pretty big public health burden. Um, the estimated annual incidence of VTE in the adult population is about one to two per thousand, and that's a number that um, I'll come back to. So one to two per thousand, one to two people out of every thousand will be affected um, annually by venous thromboembolism. In the United States, there are at least 200,000 people with symptomatic deep vein thrombosis every year. Some estimates put that quite a bit higher, as much as 600,000 people every year. And the estimate is about 50,000 with pulmonary embolism. So this is a major problem. This is a major cause of morbidity and mortality, um, especially in the adult world. And we know that the risk for recurrent venous thromboembolism, even after treatment with anticoagulation, is not insignificant. When we look at cohort studies with long periods of follow-up, we see that even in people who are adequately treated with heparin or warfarin, um, about a third, if not more, are going to experience a recurrent VTE at some point in the next 10 years. And that's a significant number of people. Um, and so despite knowing all these clinical risk factors I talked about earlier, smoking, pregnancy, obesity, central lines, et cetera, we do a pretty poor job of preventing VTE, and we do a pretty poor job of preventing its recurrence. So the question is, are these inherited prothrombotic states contributing to the patients who were not able to predict their first occurrence of VTE or were not doing a good job of preventing um, their recurrence of VTE. So in the late 90s, after we had all these tests that became available to us for testing for all these inherited traits, we wanted to know just how common are these in the population? How big a role in venous thromboembolism are these hypercoagulability traits playing? So uh, in 1997, um, there was one of the first studies published that wanted to look at sort of the incidence or the prevalence in the general population of these hypercoagulable states. And you can see that they're quite variable. Factor V Leiden, as I mentioned, is the most common with estimates of between 3 and 7% in the general population. Let me take a time out for just a minute to remind you that these population studies were all done in people of either um, European um, descent, either Northern European or Mediterranean European, or uh, mostly Caucasians in the United States. So as we look at all these numbers, just remember, this is basically only applying to Caucasians right now. Um, and I apologize, but it's because we don't have data for anyone else. Um, the prothrombin mutation, less common. If you look at antithrombin-3 deficiency, look at how relatively uncommon this is in the general population. 0.02% of the population carries um, an antithrombin-3 deficiency. Um, so some factors, very common. Some factors, not so common. Makes, you know, trying to decide if we should test people a little bit of a difficult decision. 
Well, what if we look at patients who've had a single venous thromboembolism? In the middle column there, you can see that if we take people who've had a clot and we test them for all these factors, um, we find that more people than the general population have them. So that makes sense. If we assume that these are disease-causing risk factors, it makes sense that people who get clots are more likely to have these. So factor V Leiden seen in up to 20% of patients who've had a clot. Um, overall, if you look at the combination of inherited hypercoagulability, about 50% of people with a first venous thromboembolism will have some identifiable hypercoagulability trait. And then the last column on the right, this is where the money really is with hypercoagulability testing. In families with a history of recurrent thrombosis, the prevalence of these inherited hyper hypercoagulable states is quite high. If there's one thing you can remember about the utility of hypercoagulability testing, it's that it does well at predicting thrombosis in families who already have a history of thrombosis. Whether that's useful or not, I don't know. But uh, a family history of thrombosis, let's talk about that for a minute. People who have spontaneous venous thromboembolism in multiple family members, spontaneous thromboembolism is not common. Um, people who have thromboembolism in young ages, so we usually say if you're less than 50 and you have a venous thromboembolism, even if you have some minor risk factors, uh, maybe you're a little overweight, maybe you smoke, but again, not super common in young people to have these. Women who have recurrent miscarriages, we sometimes ask about that because that can be an indicator of um, uh, hypercoagulability. Um, people in the family who've had heart attacks at young ages, um, even though the mechanism there is a little bit different, we, um, we notice a trend toward hypercoagulability in those families as well. So um, inherited hypo hypercoagulability testing, definitely useful in um, identifying families but if you take a good clinical history, you'll be able to identify those families on your own anyway. Potential benefits of testing. So this is where people like to have these uh, dueling opinion articles. So somebody will say, look at all the potential benefits of doing this testing. Maybe we can identify individuals who are at risk for future venous thromboembolism. Wouldn't that be great? We could provide them with counseling. We could tell young women that they should avoid estrogen-containing oral contraceptives. We should tell people that smoking will greatly enhance their risk of having a thrombus. We can encourage them to eat healthy and lose weight. Um, what about prophylaxis for high-risk patients? Well, that's a great idea too. If we were able to identify people who had these inherited risk factors, we could say, hey, you're super likely to have a clot in the future. Let's put you on prophylaxis. Or even if we weren't really willing to commit someone to lifelong prophylaxis, we could say, what about in these high-risk situations? What if you're going on a 12-hour plane ride to China and you have an inherited hypercoagulability state? Would that be a good um, time to consider putting you on some anticoagulation prophylaxis, like Lovenox shots? Um, or what if you're undergoing major surgery and you're going to be immobilized? Is that a good time to put someone on prophylaxis? It definitely seems like it would be. Whoops. Um, the problem with all these great ideas is that we have no good cutoff to know who is really high risk and who is not. So if we look at these um, published data about the relative risk of having a lifetime venous thromboembolism for people who have these hypercoagulable states, um, I would ask you to try and determine where your cutoff would be for committing someone to lifelong anticoagulation <laughs> prophylaxis. So factor V Leiden mutation. Your risk of having a clot compared to somebody just walking around in the general population is somewhere between 2 and 10. So if we go back to knowing that about 1 in 1,000 people will get a clot in their lifetime, if we look at the incidence in the general population, if you have one factor V Leiden mutation, your chances of having a clot only go up to 2 out of 1,000 or maybe as high as 10 out of 1,000. So still not probably a very significant risk. But if we go down to something like antithrombin-3 deficiency, if you inherit one bad copy of the antithrombin-3 gene, your relative risk may go up as high as 40. Is that significant enough of a risk to put someone on anticoagulation prophylaxis? I don't know. Well, what if we start combining defects? That's an interesting idea. Are these additive? Are they multiplicative? If we look at the risk for a factor V Leiden mutation and a prothrombin mutation, we see that the relative risk is 20. 
not super high, but when you consider that the relative risk of having either one by itself is somewhere around two, um, it appears that indeed these are um, multiplicative in, their, in the way that they change your risk. What about if you have two bad copies of Factor V Leiden? If you're a homozygous individual, well, that takes your relative risk up to 50 to 80. That's a pretty significant one. What if you look at Factor V Leiden and prothrombin and pregnancy? A hundred times. Your relative risk is a hundred compared to somebody just walking around in the general population. So you can see that as you accumulate more and more of these inherited risk factors, your chances of having a clot go up. Now what we don't know here is how do clinical risk factors also increase this? So we looked at one, we looked at pregnancy because that's an easy population to study. But what about someone with varying degrees of obesity or someone with an underlying inflammatory disorder? Um, these are hard things to quantify, and it makes decisions difficult for these patients. If we can identify patients who are at risk, where is the cutoff at which the risk warrants um, putting these patients on some sort of prophylaxis? And the answer is we don't know. So potentially a positive result will alter our management. Um, well, sure. If we find a patient with antithrombin-3 deficiency, and we know a little bit about how heparin works, we would make the informed decision to use an alternative anticoagulant because if you have low AT3 levels, heparin is not going to be an effective anticoagulant for you. So sure, in a rare case, it might change our choice of anticoagulant. What about our duration of therapy? Um, the standard anticoagulation duration is about three months if you have a clot and if it resolves, you can take them off. Um, but if you identified someone at risk for an inherited thrombophilic state, would you keep them on longer? Um, Again, it seems like a good idea, right? If we could prevent these patients from having recurrence, we would. Um, but there's no good cutoff. So let's take as an example antithrombin-3 deficiency. Again, I love to use this as an example. The most rare inherited thrombophilic state, but also probably the most severe when you look at the increase in relative risk for having a venous thromboembolism. Let's start first with an asymptomatic first-degree relative. So I see these um, in my office all the time. Somebody in the family had a clot, they did testing, they have some sort of inherited risk factor. Maybe it's prothrombin, maybe it's factor V Leiden, maybe it's the rare antithrombin-3 deficiency. So based on published reports, we know that the incidence of, of venous thromboembolism in an asymptomatic person carrying the antithrombin-3 deficiency is somewhere between 0.4 to 1.7% per year. Let's call it 1%, 1% per year. So is that a significant risk for venous thromboembolism? Well, 1% doesn't sound like a lot, but it's 1% per year. So if I have a five-year-old who's diagnosed with AT3 deficiency, what are the chances that they're going to have a clot at some point in the next 50 years of their life? Well, I know this is not really how you're supposed to do this, but 1% per year, 50 years, 50%, I don't know, it's bad math, I know. But as you live longer and longer, your risk goes up and up. So, okay, so we're, we, we say the risk of having a clot for this young kid with AT3 deficiency is 1% per year. Well, if I put this kid on heparin or warfarin, the generally accepted risk of major bleeding, major bleeding meaning not a nosebleed, um, but you get admitted to the hospital because you have a GI bleed that requires transfusion or something, the generally accepted risk of major bleeding on anticoagulation is 2% per year. So if I have a patient who's at risk of having a clot at 1% per year, but the risk of bl major bleeding if I put them on treatment is 2% per year, now what do I do? The patients are at increased risk for thrombosis, but if I try to prevent it, I'm going to make them bleed. It's a judgment call. Okay, so that's for asymptomatic people. What about people who've already had their first venous thromboembolism and have known AT3 deficiency? So they had a clot, we tested them, we found something. Great. Now we know they're at risk for having recurrent VTE. So we treat them for the appropriate amount of time, and the hazard ratio for them to have a recurrent VTE after we stop anticoagulation is somewhere around two to two and a half. Now that's pretty significant. Um, and so this is a case in which maybe it's more of a slam dunk to keep this patient on anticoagulation longer. And that brings up the question, so if we keep them on anticoagulation longer, can we actually prevent recurrent venous thromboembolism? Well, of course we can. I mean, that makes sense, right? If we keep them on their warfarin, we will prevent them from having another thromboembolism. Well, I can tell you that unfortunately we have no randomized trials that look at this. Um, but we have several large cohort studies um, looking at several thousand patients 
and they divided them into groups of um, people who were tested and people who were untested. So patients who'd had a venous thromboembolism were either categorized as having been tested for the hypercoagulable states or untested. And then regardless of how they were treated, it was provider dependent. Maybe they treated them only for three months. Maybe they did longer. We don't know. There's lots of con confounding factors. We don't know what other medical problems they had. Um, but nonetheless, when you look at these large cohorts of patients, tested versus untested, the untested patients only had an odds ratio for recurrent VTE of 1.2 compared to the tested patients. And it was not statistically significant. So even when we tested patients with venous thromboembolism and presuming that the doctor utilized the results of that testing to tailor their anticoagulation treatment, they didn't do any better job at preventing a recurrent thrombus than people who were not tested. So limitations of testing. A screening test. So in order to screen the general population, um, a disease has to be uh, prevalent enough that it's going to make a difference. We know that for many of these uh, hypercoagulable risk factors, they're just not common enough in the general population. AT3 deficiency, for example, again, 0.02% of the population carries a gene for deficiency, not common enough to make universal screening worthwhile. And we also know that even for the common ones, factor V Leiden, there's low correlation between a positive test result and um, the relative risk for having a VTE. So if 5% of us are walking around with a factor V Leiden mutation, that's one out of every 20 people in this room, assuming we were all Caucasian, um, you know, just having a positive test result isn't going to predict which one of us is going to have a thrombus. What about implications of genetic testing on an asymptomatic individual? So when I have these children come to my office and mom has some inherited hypercoagulable state and she says, I want my daughter tested. Well, what if we find out that the daughter has some significant risk factor? What is the implication on her psyche going forward? Um, you might argue, oh, it's not that big a deal, you know, having to tell the patient, maybe you're going to have a blood clot sometime in your life. Um, but what about for uh, cancer predisposition testing? This, we think of this as being much more big a deal, right? Um, and I would argue that it's sort of the same thing. If you're telling a patient, basically, you know, at some point in your life, you're going to have this medical problem happen to you, that produces anxiety. Um, and I think we do need to think about that when we're doing testing on asymptomatic people. False reassurance is, of course, a problem. Um, so you have a family come in. Everybody in the family's had clots, um, DVTs, PEs. You do testing, and you find nothing. You can't find an inherited risk factor. So what do you do? Do you tell the family, oh, good news. There's nothing that runs in your family that causes clots. Have a nice day. See you later. No, of course there's something that runs in the family that causes clots. Everybody gets clots. I have a couple of patients like this in my practice right now. Um, and we tell them, you know, we didn't find it, but clearly there's something that runs in your family and it's you know, disconcerting because we can't say exactly what it is. But nonetheless, we don't give these patients false reassurance because the lack of a positive test doesn't necessarily mean that there's not something there. It just may mean that we don't yet know how to test for it. And then there's the question of cost. So um, finding out how much something costs in the U.S. is next to impossible because everybody gets paid a different amount depending on who their insurance is. And um, some tests are run at the hospital itself and some tests are sent off to genetic labs. But in Britain, where they have the National Health Service, it's much easier to figure out how much something costs. So they can uh, run these tests in bulk for about 250 pounds, which translates to about 365 US dollars. I would argue that's a very conservative estimate of how much it would cost in the United States. But we're probably talking about only, you know, $1,000, maybe a couple thousand dollars to do the full panel of testing. So in the grand scheme of things, it's not that much. Um, of, a, of an impact on overall cost of taking care of these patients. So moving on to guidelines. So this is really the, uh, the moment you've all been waiting for. <laughs> Given all the complexities of testing and trying to decide who we should test and who we should not test and what we should do with the results of those tests, there's got to be some guidelines, right? There's got to be some established, published protocol for when we do this testing. Well, I can tell you that these are some of the ones I was able to find. Uh, the College of American Pathologists was one of the first to publish a consensus statement in 2001. It is a large, bulky document. 
it goes through case by case by case by case by case and tells you who they would recommend testing and who they would not recommend testing. It is utterly useless in my opinion. And if you look at the one produced by the International Union of Angiology and the European Genetics Foundation from 2003, or the French one from 2009, or the British one from 2010, um, or the Belgian one, or the random one from some hospital in Dublin that publishes their own guidelines for testing, they're all about the same. They're all bulky documents that give you scenario after scenario after scenario after scenario about who should be tested and who should not and what the evidence is behind that. And I can tell you the evidence is not good, no matter which guideline you're using. ACOG is interesting in that they did publish recommendations, but it's only for women who are pregnant. So not applicable to most pediatric patients. And notably missing from this list is the American Society of Hematology, ASH, and the American College of Chest Physicians. ASH is the largest uh, worldwide group of hematologists, and ACCP are the ones who publish those great anticoagulation guidelines that we reference all the time in our consults for clots that tell us how long we should be anticoagulating, what um, levels we should be shooting for for our anticoagulants. But there's nothing in there at all about thrombophilia testing, with this exception. ASH published in 2013 as part of the Choosing Wisely campaign, where we were supposed to be really looking at the evidence for the tests and the procedures that we're doing on our patients. Um, they came up with this as one of their five things that they were going to try to improve on. And they said, quote, do not test for thrombophilia in adult patients with venous thromboembolism occurring in the setting of major transient risk factors, such as surgery, trauma, or prolonged immobility. So if we take this statement and assume that they mean we should be testing everyone else, well, that's a pretty broad statement. And I would argue that that is not what they were trying to say at all, but they were simply trying to weed out some of the more obvious people who don't need testing. So, okay, we can weed out certain people who maybe we shouldn't consider testing, but still doesn't answer the question for all the other cases. So the International Society for Thrombosis and Hemostasis in 2002, interestingly, didn't publish a guideline for adults, but did publish a guideline for pediatric patients. And because VTE is rare in pediatrics, and children aren't supposed to get clots because they have great blood vessels that are intact. Um, they said a thorough laboratory evaluation should be done on every child with thrombosis. They were doing their best at the time, but I can tell you that in the 14 years now since this has been published, it has come under great scrutiny from others in the pediatric field who disagree strongly with this idea that every child with venous thromboembolism should be tested for thrombosis. So I'm gonna speed up a little bit because I'm running out of time, but pediatrics, how is it different from adults? Canada is great, again, a national health system. It's easy to uh, keep tabs on everyone who has a certain problem. This group in the early 90s kept track of all the pediatric patients who were admitted to hospitals in Canada with venous thromboembolism. They found a total of 137 cases of DVT, um, out of 256,541 admissions, which gave them an incidence of 5.3 cases per 10,000 hospital admissions, making the overall incidence of VTE in children in Canada 0 0.07 per 10,000 people. Compare that to the one in 10,000 adults, much, much, much less frequent than adults. They gave us this nice um, bit of information about what ages of von venous thromboembolism occurs in pediatrics, and this has been duplicated over the years. Uh, we know there is a greatly increased risk for thrombosis in the first year of life. Mostly that's in the newborn period for various reasons, such as your coagulation factors levels are low, there's inflammation, there's possibly infections, there's possibly central lines, et cetera, et cetera. And then again, in adolescence, um, the incidence of venous thromboembolism goes up. We also learned that um, in children with DVT specifically, the uh, association with other comorbid conditions was extremely common. So it's very similar to the adult population. Children who get clots have other problems. If you look down to uh, no cause right here, the only children who had spontaneous DVT were five out of the 137, I think which was only 3.6%. So the vast majority of kids who get clots also have other reasons to get clots, just like adults do. They have liver failure, they have nephrotic syndrome, or they have central lines. And in fact, it's not on this graph, but 45 of those children had central lines who got symptomatic 
DVTs, which was 33%. And so we also learned from the study back in the early 90s that the vast majority of clots in children are associated with central lines. Another important question, in children, um, when you look at children who have identified hypercoagulable uh, mutations, uh, what is their uh, risk for developing subsequent VTE? And I'm not going to go into the details of this table, but suffice it to say that these odds ratios show us that the likelihood of having a recurrent um, or having a first episode of a VTE in ch children with hypercoagulable states is almost exactly the same as that of adults. So the take home points for looking at children versus adults, VTE is much, much more rare in children than adults. Um, but it is associated with many of the same clinical risk factors, such as central lines and lots of other medical conditions. And it's not often idiopathic. And the highest risk for children is with those with central lines. So the questions remain, uh, does prophylaxis prevent VTE and or its recurrence in pediatric patients? There's no data, there's no trials. Are the risks of long-term anticoagulation in an active young person justified? Would you put a three-year-old who's bouncing off the walls and jumping off the bed and riding their skateboard down the street on warfarin? I don't know. Uh, what is the cost for committing someone at a young age to lifelong anticoagulation? That one we could actually figure out. But. So this is gonna be my final slide. And having now told you about all the different multifactorial aspects of venous thromboembolism in adults and pediatrics. And after explaining to you how we really have a lack of good data telling us who we should test and who we should not test, and telling us what we should do with the interpretation of those test results, this is sort of my big divulge at the end of the lecture here. When you send patients to me for a consultation regarding hypercoagulability testing, whether or not I do it, and what I do with the results is really just sort of witchcraft. I just make it up as I go along. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, to make it as simple as possible, um, there are certain cases where I definitely do not recommend testing. Uh, if you have a venous thromboembolism in a child and you have an obvious provoking risk factor, a central line is present, um, major surgery was just performed, someone's taking uh, an estrogen-containing oral contraceptive pill, these are situations where, um, assuming there's no significant family history, I wouldn't bother doing hypercoagulability testing. What about on the opposite end of the spectrum? Patients I definitely do recommend testing. So any child who has a spontaneous venal thromboembolism, that is rare and it's not normal and it should be investigated. Any child who has a venous thromboembolism with a strong family history, um, so multiple family members have had thrombosis at an early age, et cetera. That is a patient that I would recommend testing because you're more likely to find a positive test result that could inform um, your future management, including things like counseling and prophylaxis in high-risk situations. Any child with recurrent VTE, um, I would recommend testing. And then there's this gray area in the middle. So patients we consider testing. So a child with a venous thromboembolism who has a minor risk factor, um, a 13-year-old girl who comes in with a pulmonary embolism and she's significantly overweight. Is obesity a significant enough risk factor for causing a venous thromboembolism? It's up for debate. What about an asymptomatic child with a known familial genetic defect? I see these in the office all the time and I can tell you that I usually do end up testing them and that is so that I can do preventative counseling and consider prophylaxis during high risk situations in their future, but I don't put any of these kids on routine prophylaxis. Pre-organ transplant is becoming more in vogue. Uh, we see a lot of renal transplant patients in clinic for hypercoagulability testing. The reason for that is that renal um, transplant is particularly susceptible to uh, graft loss from thrombosis within the first couple of weeks after transplant, so that's a high-risk population, but there's no published guidelines about doing that. And increasingly in the world of ventricular assist devices and ECMO, we know that putting patients on artificial um, circuits increases their risk for clotting greatly, and there's some movement in that world towards testing people ahead of time in anticipation of perhaps needing to go on a VAT or needing to go on ECMO so that we can identify children who are at even higher increased risk for clotting. So again, there's very little black, there's very little white, there's a lot of gray in the area of hypercoagulability testing, but I hope that I have shed some light into this highly controversial topic within hematology. And with that, I will end and take questions.